Hi, welcome back. I'm Adam Rosen. So um, this is a, uh, a talk more geared for orthopedic residents, orthopedic fellows. Um, so feel free, if you're a patient and you're just curious, feel free to listen in. It may not make a lot of sense to you, but feel free to listen in and see what we actually do. Um, so for, for all the orthopedic um, docs out there, you have now thought through you know, how to do a knee replacement. You've thought through all of the steps. And it's hard. It's complicated. So I know that in the beginning, you know, you're thinking through the approaches and then you're just trying to think, okay, drill a hole, measure, cut, balance, implant. It's a lot of steps. As you get further on, what you will start to recognize is that there's a lot more information with every single step. And today, what I'm trying to talk to you about is that there's a lot more to think about with this thing than just making four cuts. Um, and there's a lot of things that you may not have even thought of looking for. Um, because I know in the beginning I didn't, and I started to learn from my experience what I can learn from each individual system and each implant company. So I'm going to jump ahead, and we're not even going to talk about cutting the distal femur and, and all those things. I'm, now you have sized, so you have the size that you think, and you've set your rotation. And depending on your thought process, you might do distal femur tibia, um, and then gap balance to set your rotation, or you may measure resection, use your epicondylar access, um, or poster referencing systems to set your holes for your four-in-one cutting guide. However you do that, that's fine. I'm just talking about when you've decided where you're going to put this thing, what are the next steps to look for. Now, this is from the triathlon system from Stryker. Um, I do like it just because it has this additional handle, which I use for more than just a handle. Um, other systems, you know, you just have a block and you can hold it on, but you can usually use some type of instrument from their system to give you this eyeball thing. So when I put the four-in-one cutting guide on, um, there's a lot of things that I think about, and I'm going to show you with the saw bones, but you're not just looking at width. You know, you have to think about the top, you have to think about the bottom, and you have to think about rotation, and all of those things will help you. So, I mean, for example, um, one of the things that I learned early on was when you're doing a valgus knee. You know, everybody's taught early on, oh, valgus knee, there's lateral wear, so it's going to internally rotate your femur. So if you're posterior referencing, you have to add a shim or some sort to make sure that you externally rotate it. That's what we're all taught. And then you do that, and then what you recognize is when you go to balance the knee, the lateral compartment is tight, and the medial side is loose. And now what you wind up doing is releasing and releasing and releasing and upsizing your poly to balance the flexion gap. I'm sure you've all been there. I was. And what I started to recognize is that if I also remember that many times the lateral condyle is dysplastic, what I'm doing is I'm actually looking at a lot of factors and not that I internally rotate the component, but I don't overly externally rotate the component. And that balances the flexion gap. And you might see this now if you've had more experience with NAV and MAKO and other robotics. You can look at this thing on a, on a screen and you can see where you can change the femoral component and that will dictate where the cuts occur. But forget the robot. Forget the machine because the machine may break or you may not have it or maybe you didn't get the CAT scanner and you couldn't use it for whatever reason and you have to use the 4-in-1 cutting guide. That's what I'm going to show you based on these saw bones. So hopefully all of this will make sense to you. Okay, so here you have your distal femur. I've been playing around. The saw bones is on its last legs. So when you drop your four-in-one cutting guide in your hole, and this is kind of why I like this system, is that this essentially becomes a little mini drop rod. So when you put this in there, you can very quickly look at your tibial axis and make sure that you like your rotation. You may have cut your tibia already, but at least this gives you this perpendicular ability of looking at, is my component internally or externally rotated in relation to that axis? The next thing that I look at is the width. So again, just because you sized it, you want to make sure that your width looks appropriate. So if the width looks extremely small or extremely big, you may have to second guess what you thought the size was. The next thing that I do is we look at the top and at least in this system, my finger should go over and I should have a little room where I can grab the back of the capture block. Usually for most knees, what that means is that my cut's going to be appropriate because if the block is too low, where the cutting guide is flush with the bottom of the trochlea, that is an indication to me that I am more likely going to notch. So you might check it with an angel wing. Some people always check it. But again, having these references where you can feel and go, okay, that feels about right. That's where I need to be with this particular system. So certain systems, 
cut up more. Like this cuts up seven degrees. Certain systems don't cut up as much. So depending on how much you flexed your distal femur, you may be more or less likely to notch. So you want to have some sort of reference there. The next thing that I'm looking at too is the amount of posterior resection. And again, this depends on the patient um, and it depends on the anatomy. At least with this system, what I find is usually what I'm looking at is the bottom cut on my lateral side is just above where the cartilage is. And the cut on the medial side is going to take the cartilage plus a little bit of a bone. And that usually means that my rotation is set up. So if I know that, say, someone is already a little loose in flexion and this cutting guide was quite high, um, that cut is going to be excessive. That may overly increase my flexion gap. So I may have to posteriorize um, or do something to take less bone off of the back. Whereas if they were very tight in flexion and this cutting guide is sitting very posterior and I'm not going to take a lot of bone, that's the first question that I have to ask is, do I need to anteriorize um, or will I notch if I'm not taking a lot of bone off the back? Or do I need to you know, change the size of the component and anteriorize to prevent a notch from occurring? And the other thing, which is what we were talking about before as far as rotation, is that for me, most varus knees that are normally balancing in my hands as like an arthritic knee, I do my distal femur, I size, and I do my rotation, and I, I do my four-in-one cutting guide. But for valgus knees or strange knees where they have a strange deformity, I'll do my distal femur, and I'll do my tibia. And once I drop this in, again, I'm looking at my rotation. I'm using the drop rod on the handle or some type of drop rod. If I've cut my distal femur, I'll put my lamina spreaders in and attach them here to the tibia. And I'll balance my ligaments as part of my releases in the beginning. I've removed the osteophytes and I'm looking at the rotation. And again, if I find that the rotation's off, I may rotate it one way or the other. But to do that without a nav without a robot is I may open this hole. So if people have used, say, Mako, for example, or any of the robot systems, you may pin it here and rotate the medial side up or down to internally or externally rotate it. Or you might pin it here and rotate the lateral side up or down depending on the rotation that you want to get. So what I'll usually do is take the mallet and a pin and I'll just drive a hole above or below the pin and arc it up and down. So I create a little oval and then, which is why I also like this handle, is that I can then take that and then I can rotate or pivot my four-in-one cutting guide to where I think the rotation needs to be to set the balancing. I can also lift up with the handle and get an idea on my flexion gap as far as balancing by using that handle to lift up. And then once I've set the rotation where I think it needs to be, then I can pin my block and I can make my cuts. When I make my anterior cut, make my anterior chamfer cut, I'm looking for this little eye of the sulcus, but if you make your anterior cut, I always start medial, and if it looks like I'm gonna notch, this is where I have to stop, versus being aggressive, making this lateral cut and getting right into a big hefty notch, you wanna be careful of that. Now, when I do my four-in-one cutting guide, I kind of use that mobile window philosophy. So I'll go anterior chamfer. My retractors on the medial side, I do medial and then the posterior medial chamfer, move my retractor to the lateral side, lateral cut, lateral chamfer, and then lastly finish my anterior chamfer. But that becomes dealer's choice. I think the more important thing, though, is when you put this on is do not think of this simply as just a four-in-one cutting guide. This is an additional way for you to check before you do anything, am I going to notch? Do I like my sizing? Based on the patient, do I have enough bone? Am I taking too much or too little before I make my cut? Do I need to adjust my rotation? And especially for knees that are abnormally balancing with their arthritic knee, these valgus knees, I think more people have a tendency to overly externally rotate it. You don't take a lot of bone laterally. You wind up taking excessive bone medially. And then you wind up having to release this lateral side aggressively to make up for that over resection that you've occurred on the medial side. So by you know, doing a little gap balancing technique or looking for other anatomic landmarks, when you're using more of a conventional four-in-one cutting guide, you're more likely to wind up with a knee that is balanced at the end without having to do excessive releases.
Well, I hope that helps. Uh, I hope that next time you pick up this four-in-one cutting guide and you slap it on the distal femur, that instead of just making four cuts, um, that you really look at it and start to picture in your mind, you know, width, rotation, anterior posterior sizing, and then referencing what the bony resections look like, and then thinking about that at the end of the case, if you are not balanced as well as you would have liked, if you could go back and adjust the position of the block or the rotation of the block, would that have made a difference? And if you start to see those same things happen every time you have a varus near, every time you have a valgus near, with this particular implant or that implant, it may help you better determine in the future for patients where the block should be most appropriately positioned for them to get the best balanced knee possible. Thanks again for listening. I'm Adam Rosen. If you haven't already, please check out my podcast, Total Knee Tips and Pearls podcast, for even more discussions about topics like this. Take care.